Um, so um, we're just delighted to have you with us. Um, yes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Are you tired? No. Not. No, but it's been a long day. Five o'clock. But we are still waiting for you. Excellent. I'm very pleased. Well, I want to pay tribute to you. Thank you for coming to this workshop. Thank you for coming to our lovely city, our interesting city. I want to pay tribute to Penn. And I want to pay tribute to Corsi. It's an honor to be on this platform with you. My sister and I want to pay tribute to you who does the same work as I do without a big fat judicial salary and car. <laughs> Whenever people say thank you for coming out, try to remind them that I get a big fat salary and I've got an official car. <laughs> so, so discount that. Okay. And I really okay. do, my that's, sister. Thank that's you. That's all for you're in for, it. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this time. What I want to do is I want to talk for about 15 or 16 minutes, not, not long. And I want to start by saying that I'm a proudly gay man. And I want to tell you why. I'm a gay man because that's the way I am. It's part of my constitutive humanity. It's part of what makes me human. And my gayness is as much part of me as being white is. And why am I proud? It's because I'm proud to be white. Not because it's better than being black, but just because that's me. I think that's fine. And so with my gayness, it's perfectly fine to be gay. I've got no choice about it. If I'd had a choice about it, I would not be here this afternoon telling you that I'm a gay man. For the first, first 30 years of my life, I fought against it. I dated girls, I got involved in relationships, I got married, and at the age of 30, I said no. This is not truthful. It's not me. It's not, it's not the way I am. You cannot build a life of integrity and truthfulness if you don't build it on the things that are deepest within yourself. Whether it's your culture, or your religion, or your humanity, whatever it might be that's important to you. At the age of 30, after a divorce, a very painful divorce, I'm very privileged and honored still to be a close friend of my former wife. We see each other twice a year for our two birthdays. Uh, after that painful divorce, I decided never again, I will never apologize again for what I am. When I came out, it was apartheid era South Africa in the 1980s. I was a human rights lawyer in my early 30s. And I did two things. The one is that I fought human rights cases under the apartheid system, but I also fought for gay and lesbian equality. And I did it because those issues are integrally interlinked. And I want to say to you why I think this issue is so difficult. And I think there's some very interesting interrelated reasons. The first and most obvious reason is that it's about sex. And it's uncomfortable to talk about sex. You know, I didn't ask Sarah how her sex life is or what her sexual orientation is. I might want to know, but I didn't. Because it's a delicate issue, ladies and gentlemen, and rightly. It's a delicate issue, and I'm telling you something about my sexual functioning. I'm telling you that I'm erotically disposed towards people of the same gender. I like men, I love men, I like sex with men. It's a very intimate, personal, difficult thing to talk about. So by proclaiming my homosexuality and claiming pride in it, I'm telling you something very intimate, and there's very, something very difficult about that. The second issue is an important one in Africa, why I think this is so difficult, and that's invisibility. It's because no one knew that I was gay until at the age of 29, I said, I'm gay. The people said, you can't be gay. You know, you, you're a butch man. Well, I, I am gay. And with, with most homosexual people, men and women, transgender, intersex people, we're invisible. There are some effeminate men, not all of them are gay, by the way. How many of you have got effeminate male relatives who are quite straight? We've all got them. And a lot of women. Who, who knows a woman soccer player? She's not lesbian, ladies and gentlemen. Even though some of them are. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, our invisibility is our difficulty. Because if I look at you, sir, I know that you're black. And you can say you're proud of being black in the same way that I can see, say I'm proud of being white. But I don't know what your sexual orientation is. And in Africa, we don't know people's sexual orientation. Why? Because it's been such a source of terror and repression and torture and violence and persecution. And that's terrible and it's wrong. So our invisibility 
is a difficult thing, but there's a third and more important reason why this is such a difficult issue. It's because homosexuality challenges established gender norms. It says to Raymond, Raymond, so far as I know, you're a self-identifying heterosexual man. I'm not going to ask Raymond if he ever had a gay thought. But he I always identified, I know his daughter, a beautiful daughter, very talented daughter. But when I say to Raymond, I'm gay, I'm challenging the way that Raymond has built his life, which has been on the assumption that there are two types of people in the world, men and women, and that they're attracted to each other and that their mission is to progenerate humanity. I'm saying no. I'm saying I can have children. I can have children with Corsi if I want to. Corsi can have children. But that your patterning of life in Africa, in all your societies, in Uganda, Zambia, Malawi, Kenya, South Africa, I'm challenging that. And that's what's so difficult about this issue. And that's why we got this backlash. So ladies and gentlemen, I fought for this issue as a human rights lawyer. And our biggest boon and role model was a young man called Simon McCordy. And he came from Civil King Township, the Vol, just 60 kilometers from here. And he took part in a massive uprising, a terrible, terribly violent bloody uprising on the 1st of September 1984. And Simon was put on trial for his life during the apartheid era. And he was accused number five, number 13, in the, in the, in, in, in the Delmas treason trial. And Simon did a remarkable thing. I was a white middle class lawyer. I'd been to Salamash University, I'd been to Oxford, I'd been a Rhodes Scholar. For me to come out as a middle class person, as a white person, because race is so important here, was nothing. Simon was an activist from the townships. I met him when he was in prison. He asked to see me, and I went to see him in Pretoria prison. And Simon said to his fellow trialists, I'm gay. It was an act of astonishing courage, ladies and gentlemen. That act of courage 30 years ago in South Africa is being replicated in your countries. Because lesbians, gay men, intersex people are coming out in similar conditions of terror and repression and persecution and violence and bloodshed. But Simon took a stand. And because he was an activist, he said, I'm black, I'm oppressed, I'm poor, I'm from a township but I'm also gay and I cannot separate those capacities. And that was Simon's insight. He said, I will not be an activist for freedom in South Africa and a gay man on the side. I will not be a gay man and an activist for freedom on the side. I can only be one thing, which is an activist for everyone's freedom, including my own. And Simon laid the basis for us to go into the negotiations and say, we are testing you. We're a minority. We know much more about LGBTI orientation, ladies and gentlemen, than we knew 30 years ago. We know that it's inherent to humanity. You've heard a lot of myths about it. The one myth is that this is a human thing. It's not a human thing. They're penguins. I've got two tortoises, by the way. <laughs> what is an afudo? What is your language from Kenya, sir? Luya. Luya. What is a tortoise in, in, in Luya? Is it ufudo? Is there a link? The, the, the word in, in our languages, <laughs> ufudo, is a tortoise. I've got two male tortoises. Why have I got two male tortoises? Not because I'm gay, but because the <laughs> conservation department won't allow you to breed tortoises. They will only allow you to keep same gender tortoises. And my two gay tortoises try to mount each other. Anyway, it is a myth to say that this is confined to humanity. There is same sex behavior across every species. In, and look it up, don't, don't rely on me, go for science. We know, ladies and gentlemen, that 5 to 10 percent of all humankind, Muslim, Jewish, Orthodox, Wasp, are you a Wasp, bro? I can ask you that at least. No, I don't think so. Oh, he is. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, he's a Wasp. He's a white Anglo Saxon Protestant. Raymond, you're a pillar of the establishment. <laughs> well, white Anglo Saxon Protestant. Yes, exactly. I'm picking on Raymond because he's also a white male. Else. No, he's <laughs> a white Anglo Saxon Protestant. Mm -hmm. But ladies and gentlemen, 5 to 10% of your family, you don't know it, but may I assure you that you've got cousins, brothers, parents, children, neighbors, community members, congregants who are same-sex oriented. And the only reason you don't know them is because they've been too scared to tell you. So ladies and gentlemen, we fought for this. Why did we fight for it? We fought for it for the reasons that Simon gave. 
with such a vulnerable part of humanity being involuntarily same-sex oriented, unless we fight for equality, humanity and recognition of this minority, we have lost the fight for justice and human rights on our continent. And that's why we fought for it. And to their credit, the negotiators in this remarkable moment, President Mandela, President Mbeki, George Bezos, L.B. Sachs, Arthur Chaskelson, the negotiators adopted our position. I said we've got to include sexual orientation. And we had a miracle in 1994. Sexual orientation was included in our constitution. And at the end of that year, President Mandela appointed me as a judge of the High Court, a proudly, openly gay man who'd fought for justice, fought against apartheid, but also fought for sexual orientation and equality. I spent six years in the High Court, eight years in the Court of Appeal. For the last six years, I've been in the Constitutional Court. And the interesting thing is that every time I applied for a judicial promotion, no one ever said to me, you're a gay man, how can you be on South Africa's highest court? No one's ever said that to me, ladies and gentlemen, and you know why? Because it's right. My homosexuality has nothing to do with my capacity to contribute to my court. My capacity to contribute depends on how hard I work, on my integrity, on my truthfulness, on my principles, on my idea of social justice. That's what I was tested for in every interview. That's the same in pen. It's the same in your newspaper or your writer's circle or your hometown or your organization or your industry. It's exactly the same. Our capacity to contribute to each other constructively doesn't depend on our linguistic grouping. In South Africa, we're obsessed with race, understandably, because of th 300 years of racial oppression. People like Raymond and me, sorry to pick on you, Raymond. <laughs> But we are white males, and we were the culprits. We have got to take our share of it. I benefited from apartheid. I was a poor kid in a children's home, but I got a big break. I got into a very, very good high school because I was white. I went to a very good tertiary education institution called Stellenbosch University. I got a Rhodes Scholarship, and it was all because of racial privilege. So the things that have shaped me have been my homosexuality, my whiteness, and my commitment to social justice. But ladies and gentlemen, I want, to, I want to end off by saying that this is a test case for our Africanness. It's a test case for our capacity to be inclusive and tolerant. And I want to get brutal with you. I want you to ask me tough questions. I'll give you tough answers back. Let us look, not just at Africa, but let us look where intolerance of diversity has got us in this world. Let us look at Yugoslavia. Look at, let us look at the Caucasus. Let us look at Syria. Let us come closer to home. South Sudan. Do you know how many people have been killed in South Sudan since 1958? Does anyone know? Two million people. How many people have been killed in the Democratic Republic of Congo since 1961? Is there an American here? I like to pick on the Americans. Who thinks that the Americans created the pathology that resulted in that, those terrible wars, I do personally, by the way. American responsibility, CIA responsibility for the dysfunction in our continent, I think, is large. But five million people, ladies and gentlemen, five million lives lost in Central African region in the last 40, 50 years. As we were becoming a democracy in, in, in Rwanda, 900,000 people, 10,000 people a day for 90 days, killed by their own neighbors, sometimes their family members, community members. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our alternative. And as Archbishop Tutu says, get over it. I'm a gay man. We've got famine. We've got corruption. We've got misgovernance. We've got corruption. We've got crop failures. We've got drought. We've got developmental issues. Those are the issues that we as Africans should be concerned about. And you as writers, what are the issues that you should be concerned about? Injustice, the liberation of the human spirit. And we are right at the core of that challenge for you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Adam. That was wonderful. Um, do we have any questions? No, but I'm going to make a comment. Okay. I like the way you started your introduction. 
as a crowd. Okay? So, for me, he settles everything. 